if you're reading the Bible, there are some good breadcrumbs that we can glean kind of to give us real insight as to what happened to the ark. I mean, I'm going to ask this question. Do any of you ever ask these type of questions? Where did this thing go? Why did it disappear? And if in all the different theories that we can propose, is there one that would be more plausible that we could say, yes, if we're putting all the theories out there, this is the one that is the most tenable of all. In 1981, film and movie director Steven Spielberg took us on a fantastic journey back to the year 1936 when explorer and archaeologist named Indiana Jones was hired by the U.S. government to find the Ark of the Covenant before Adolf Hitler did. It was a fantastic, when I say fantastic, as in fantasy uh, concept. And I'm sure that for people who didn't know about the Ark, had no biblical reference, that was maybe the first exposure people had. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, just a movie with Hollywood license and liberty. If you remember, uh, towards the end of the movie, the lid is lifted, and what first looked like angelic beings swirl around, and then it's obviously revealed as death pours out and consumes those who look upon these entities that are floating through the air, only to be put back in the ark. And the final scene is the ark being put into a crate and being sealed up. For most of us who watched that iconic film, um, we know that the closing scene is not the way it happened. I mean, the movie is one thing, but probably for most of us, that closing scene brought up another round of nagging questions. What happened to the Ark? You know, if you watch programs on TV like Ancient Aliens, and you know, listen, I gotta hand it to some of those folks who took what we would watch um, discovery type, scientific type programs or educational programs, and they put a little spin on it, making it weird and out there, and people tune in. Well, that particular program, they like to talk about different things. Everything comes back to being a potential spaceship. Um, so the Ark of the Covenant could be, according to them, a spaceship. Uh, and listen, I, weirder things have been said, right? Except what I would say to you is, if you're reading the Bible, there are some good breadcrumbs that we can glean kind of to give us real insight as to what happened to the Ark. I mean, I'm going to ask this question. Do any of you ever ask these type of questions? Where did this thing go? Why did it disappear? And if in all the different theories that we can propose, is there one that would be more plausible that we could say, yes, if we're putting all the theories out there, this is the one that is the most tenable of all. So the origin of the ark, as we know, begins in Exodus 25. And I actually wasn't going to read Exodus 25, but I just right now changed my mind. For the benefit of those who do not have a Bible, who may be listening by radio, this gets a little complicated when I just assume that everybody knows the story. So Exodus 25, beginning at about verse 10, God is giving the instructions to Moses. And if you remember many times over, and specifically we will read of this in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, where very clearly it's repeated. Make sure basically that you, you build everything according to the pattern, according to the measurements, according to the specifications which I have given you. God speaking essentially to Moses. And why? Why was there a necessity to make it exact? Because what we are looking at, everything that God basically designs for the children of Israel to worship is essentially, we're looking at, from our eyes, we're looking at reality being constructed, but in reality, it is only the, t 
type of the actual that the Bible says is in heaven. So what we see is the visible. We think it is the actual, but actually it's the shadow of the actual that is in heaven. Does that make sense? Hope so. Okay. So God gives the commandment to Moses, amongst other things. Of course, we know that God's going to say basically, build a tabernacle, build a tent with specific measurements. And every single piece, uh, every measurement in this tabernacle all have basically representation, symbolism, numerology. You can keep going, but they all point back to Christ. So it's almost as though God put all this, uh, laid all it out, and for our Jewish brothers and sisters who do not read the New Testament, they're only going to read the tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the things that pertain, and there can't actually be a depth of understanding. Sorry, I mean, I'm just going to say it like it is. There cannot be a depth of understanding to our Jewish friends of what this actually represents. Why? Because when we go into the New Testament, we see that everything that was here, God designed to point to Christ. Everything, uniquely. I would say with exception of one thing that does not exactly represent Christ, everything else in measurements, in numerology, in color, they all point to Christ. So let me read a little bit for those folks who are at home listening, and then we'll go on and say some more things here. So beginning at verse 10, chapter 25, the book of Exodus, and they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length of thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Very carefully, and you have to actually read the words that are here because you'd be surprised what people have done with this. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. So one thing here I'm going to just point out is it was basically acacia wood covered with gold and read carefully within and without. So it was covered in gold inside and out, but it, it is wood overlaid. And this becomes important to all those numbnuts out there who want to calculate the weight of the ark and haven't figured out that it's not pure gold because pure gold would change the weight. How could four men think about this, really? It's a super genius here. Actually, I was reading some super genius who wrote an article about the weight and calculated the weight to be somewhere at about 1,000 pounds. And that is ridiculous. Why? Because if you figure out the wood box, the dimensions of the wood box overlaid with gold, the loops and the poles that went in to carry it, and four men would carry this. Uh, if it was pure gold, I think we might need a few extra men. Uh, but anyway, that's just a sidebar. Sometimes I think it's really crazy how people will not read the details to know that this is an important detail. It was not pure gold, okay? So don't go crazy with me here. And it says, and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about, and shall cast four rings of gold for it, put them in the four corners thereof. The two rings shall be in the one side, the two rings on the other. Thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, overlay them with gold. Thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. So you get the picture. Imagine a box, and imagine loops on each side of the box, and the poles go through the loops, and the men would carry them basically on the pole, resting approximately here, two men on each side. So you get the idea. It's pretty simple, straightforward. Thou shalt put in the ark, into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Now, three things will go into the ark. The testimony which will be the second set of the Ten Commandments. The first set was broken in the hands of man, which I don't know why. When people analyze that text, it should be enough to know the picture of the tables of, first tables of stone being broken in man's hand, really representative of man's inability to perfectly keep the law. But nevertheless, three things will go into the ark. Second table, set of stones of the Ten Commandments, uh, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded overnight. And I'll discuss these three items in a minute. Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Now, here's what's important. Distinguish between the box, I'm calling it a box for right now to, to use words we can all relate to, the box which was wood covered 
gold inside and out versus the mercy seat of pure gold. That covering, no wood in it, and that's also important. Why? Because we know when we're looking at this in terms of types, the acacia wood represents Christ's humanity, the gold, the inside and out covering represents his eternal deity and nature. So when we get into seeing these things, the seat of pure gold, the covering, why was this important? This, if you want to, again, I'm sorry to use these terms, but this box essentially would be known as the place where God's presence would radiate from, God's Shekinah glory. So it would be important for the mercy seat itself, where the blood would be sprinkled by the high priest on the Day of Atonement, to be pure in nature, eternal in nature, because everything is going to point back to Christ when we start making these analyses. Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. So we know what the mercy seat basically is the covering, the two angels with their wings kind of open but folded facing each other. And this also will become important as a type looking into the New Testament. So keep all of these concepts, kind of don't, don't park them and don't forget them because they will come alive in the New Testament. So um, we have the two cherubims and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look to one another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet thee, there we meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel." So there we have basically the description. Uh, the measurements themselves, and let's kind of put this into easier terms to follow for those folks who don't even know what a cubit is. Uh, just Let's just say it like this. Let's say that we could put the, the length of the arc at about four feet long and the height and width at about two and a half feet uh, wide and high. So the measurements themselves could we could go down the path of using numbers, which we often do. Numbers are important in the Bible. And I will tell you that in the Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism, they take it to the extreme with numbers. I believe that there is something to the numbers, but would I tell you that everything has a number uh, with some encrypted code in it? No, okay? So if we took the number, rounding it out to this, what we'll call it, easy to follow four feet, we could say that the box, basically, the arc represents four times two. Four is the number of the whole earth, times two is eight, which is the number of new beginnings. It's also the number representing the resurrection. For the height and the width, we've got 2.5, so 2.5 feet times two is five, and five both ways being the number of grace, and if you want 10 being the number, we could go on and on with all the numbers, but they represent, they all represent something. You could pick apart every item, save the table of showbread, and give clear understanding that these are all, essentially, forget about Old and New Testament, these are all types prefiguring some dimension of Christ's work, of Christ's life, and we could, I could elaborate, if time permitted, I could elaborate on them all. But... Uh, when we talk about the lid or the covering, um, it's important for us to understand, like I said, that this lid or covering, pure gold, unlike the rest, which was overlaid. And then we can go back if we want to talk about weight, which is completely irrelevant, but somebody thought it was really important. And um, maybe towards the end, if I have time left over, I'll, I'll read you some interesting calculations on weight just for the sake of telling you what people do with their spare time. Uh, <laughs> not a very good use of it, I think. Okay, so eventually Moses will be commanded to put, as I mentioned, three items into the ark, uh, and we'll discuss those. The two uh, cherubims, which I just discussed, and when we start kind of getting into the whole sum total, you'll realize that a lot of what is said here appears in the book of Hebrews when it talks about the 
offerings and the sacrifices, how Christ is much better than the old dispensation and how God basically put all this in place until the coming of Christ. And now Christ basically, he is the final sacrifice. Whereas there is, there's not a continuous need for sacrificing. But in Hebrews 9, 4, sometimes I think, I quote things and I think, you know, I should turn there because not everybody will believe when I quote things uh, if you're not familiar with your Bible. So Hebrews 9, 4 um, says, talking about after the second veil, the tabernacle, tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the cover, covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. So you can see, again, I don't, I don't know how to stop right here and say something that could help a lot of people out there who grapple. I hear these words spoken often. I only read the New Testament. If you're only reading the New Testament, you will not get a full picture of Christ. You need the old and the new, and this is why the book of Hebrews basically is recapping what we're looking at in a way basically to tell us Christ. God gave all of this, but how much better is Christ? Ultimately, all that he is sufficient for us. We don't need the repeated sacrifices or all the elements that once God said, this is the prescribed way to commune with me. So, um, we have this portion I just read to you out of Hebrews. And so let's talk a little bit about the manna, uh, the whatchamacallit bread, right? Sometimes called bread from heaven, sometimes called angel's food, sometimes called light bread. Uh, the manna would appear every morning around the camp uh, when the dew fell on the ground, similar to hoarfrost. It looked like a small, round, coriander-type wafer, light or white, tasted like, slightly like honey, like a sweet taste to it. And the leaders of each person's household would go out and gather uh, one omer, which is two dry quarts, every morning, except for the sixth day where they would gather double for the Sabbath. So if there was any left on the ground, we know that the sun would melt it away and then you'd have the next day's provisions. Sometimes people got greedy and they tried to take more than they should and God warned them about that. Kind of interesting. I, I love the way God basically says, look, this is what I want you to do. Don't go beyond this. And if you go beyond this, this is what's going to happen. And sure enough, I'm sure people were tempted to see, well, you know, like the garden, did God really say? So let's go out and collect more and let's see what happens. Well, worms and maggots came out of if you, if you took more than you needed. So it's almost like, you know, God's got a really good sense of what we need. We are the ones who are skewed in our thinking. Then the children of Israel, by the way, um, they figured out real quickly when God said, gather an omer, you gather an omer, don't, don't do beyond God's word what he says. So Aaron was given the commandment to collect an omer of manna and to put it in a gold bowl and to place it inside the ark. So in giving the manna to the children of Israel, God showed that he was able to sustain their physical and their spiritual needs. But more than that, see, this is why I said you can't read these books separated old and new. You get into the New Testament, John 6, 32, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And this bread of life came down from heaven to be basically our sustenance. Here we have the picture of the manna, God's provision coming down every single day, actual food that God provide while they were in the wilderness, while they were wandering. So the manna does foreshadow Christ in many ways. The manna was provided in the wilderness, not in their homeland. Eventually they would cross over to the other side and be in the land that God promised. But the manna was for their wilderness wandering during the 40 years, which represents a complete time of testing. So it's kind of interesting if you think about this, like we are taught in the New Testament, the disciples prayer, right? Give us this day our daily bread. Here is every day going out to collect manna. There's so many parallels that if you think these are uh, separate and distinct, 
it really is a tragedy. I'm just going to keep repeating myself until somebody actually hears me. It's a tragedy that people don't put the old and the new together. They fit perfectly, like lock and key, and unfold a lot of the things that if you only had the Old Testament, you wouldn't understand. If you only had the New Testament, you wouldn't understand. But together, they bring clarity and they make sense. The next thing that was in the ark was Aaron's rod that budded. And the story of the budding rod is recorded in Numbers 16 and 17. And if you remember, this is one of my favorite passages. It's where Korah uh, and that band, they gather 250 leaders from the tribes. And they basically challenge Moses and Aaron's right to lead the people. Moses accepts the challenge. And basically, God vindicated his leadership by swallowing up the rebels in the ground. I love that. I just wish that God was having hungry Earth Day more often. Um, and the next day, the rest of the folks were killed by fire. Well, you know, listen, I, I like this. They went out, they said, you're killing the children of Israel, you're killing the congregation. God said, okay, psh, and fire consumes those people. But basically God, I like the way this, God instructs Moses to select representatives from the tribes. They will inscribe the tribe for each representative will bring a rod. And they will all place the rods in the same place, 12 rods. And whoever's uh, rod, basically, that is placed in there, that uh, buds, and in this case it also bore fruit, this will be the one that God chooses to be the high priest. So they all, 12 of them, gather their rods together, and the next day it is Aaron's rod that budded and also produced fruit. Almonds were the fruit from this rod. So this was the vindication. God saying, this is who I choose, and this is the proof, and if you don't like it, there's the earth. Now, he didn't say that part, but trust me, if I was God, I would have said that. So, here we have Aaron's rod that's placed in the ark. And if you think about it, the rod also represents another thing, which is obedience or rebellion towards the things of God. So, it's a little kind of sidebar. But what we have finally put into the ark, the second set of unbroken Ten Commandments, the pot of manna that Aaron gathered, and Aaron's rod that budded. So it's kind of interesting, all placed in the ark, and we kind of, we can't say, okay, and that's the end of that, because there's several things that are recorded in this book that kind of give us the breadcrumb uh, for us to gather and go along the way. Now, before I talk about what happened to the ark, the mercy seat, uh, it points to Christ's sacrifice and his finished work showing us not just the Day of Atonement, because if you remember, the high priest went in and sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. What this was representing for us is essentially not one day, but cleansing every day by Christ's finished work. So there is that for which now we are in right standing. We don't have to do, see, in the Day of Atonement, they still had to bring their offerings and offer the offerings and go through a whole set of rituals. God basically took that concept, if you will, but that's the shadow. Christ becomes the actuality. So we don't have a Day of Atonement anymore. The, the great Day of Atonement was at Calvary when Jesus died on the cross. So we know, as I said, we know that the ark was carried into Canaan and they crossed the River Jordan. We read about this in the book of Joshua and how it was instrumental uh, I wouldn't say the ark itself, but God's presence. That's really the key thing right there. And if, if you keep thinking about it, God's presence with the people. Um, several times in, in this book, specifically in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, we'll read of this ark. Now, the ark of the covenant is one. We have Noah's ark. We also have the ark that... Moses was placed in. These three concepts actually all represent the same thing. Safety within, and in this case, safety within the arms of God, safety within God's presence. The idea that with him, 
real secure. You could jump to Psalm 91. You could jump to a ton of places in the Bible to confirm what I'm saying. But that's the concept. Um, the words that, even the Hebrew words that go along with this, the covering, the kapureth, um, all of these basically kind of dovetail into a singular concept. So if we're looking, we have clarity of the representation of the ark. And now the ark will begin to kind of uh, make its way through the pages of the Bible. So as I started in Joshua, as I said, and we'll see the ark through 400 years of judges. Um, it was housed at Shiloh. And then apostasy began. So about, not to say that the children of Israel weren't always engaged in falling away and being rebellious, but it's really during the time of the judges, so in the book of Judges, during the time of the judges, that we see apostasy and rebellion really begin to happen. If you remember, uh, we've got the rejection of God's prophet. That kind of is really the beginning of people turning their back on God in some way or another. Um, we know that the children of Israel carry the ark into battle against the Philistines and kind of think of their thought process. They, some probably looked at the ark and understood its uh, reverent presence, but I think other people looked at the ark as a good luck charm. And I think God basically saw how they were treating the ark as they went into battle more as a good luck charm than as a sign of God's presence with them. So it wasn't too long before God gave the victory to the Philistines. They basically annihilated them in battle, and God let them, the Philistines, take the ark. And this is one of the more comical things. You know, you'd have to have a wonderful mind to invent, to fabricate the Bible. And why do I say that? Because there are stories woven through every book, kind of interconnected, but written at different times and different places by different people. So if you're one of those people that says, I don't believe it, it's impossible. Yeah, it's pretty impossible. That's why it's so miraculous. And that's why when you read it, you, if you're really reading this book, you're going to find that it is impossible that one person singularly wrote this. And it's impossible. Sorry, I'm not saying because I believe this. You ought to think it's true. But if you really understand how much is woven together, it would take a great coincidence and a whole lot of luck for someone to fabricate and make it turn out just the way it did with all the representations and everything else. So, uh, but back to my story. Kind of interesting how when the Philistines had the Ark of the Covenant, they take it to their temple to be housed with their god, Dagon. And that's a pretty funny story if you know the, the, the uh, certain things that happened. But they were so freaked out by having the Ark in their presence because all kinds of stuff was happening. And eventually, these Philistines figured out, it's the ark, let's get rid of it because it's messing us up. It's doing all kinds of, you know, they, they had the sense that the children of Israel actually didn't have if you want to go down that pathway. So they want the ark out of their midst and they return it to the children of Israel. <laughs> I really like that idea. Like, oh, we don't want this thing. So it first went to Gath. And the men of the city there were afflicted with sickness. And then it went to Ekron, and a similar situation happened. Then it was loaded on a cart and hauled by two cows to Beth Shemesh. And the people of that town ventured out, curiosity and other things to see. And we know the story that happened there ends up in tragedy with a great number of people being killed. Somebody might say, well, if it's, if it's the Ark of the Covenant, why did God, why did he put we'll call it this uh, sadistic concept attached to it, to look upon it, to touch it, because God said, and this is the thing that people seldom grasp, they, they'll spend their time spinning their wheels about why, because God said so, God said don't touch, and God doesn't have to explain, see this is the thing we all get wrong, we might have to explain to one another, God does not owe us an explanation. You can say, well, that's not fair. Well, there's a lot of things in life that aren't fair. He does not have to explain it to us. And guess what? There's a lot he doesn't. And that's why you have people that come up with some of the craziest ideas. But 
what I like about this is that if you really see kind of how the ark was being understood, it's not until really the time that David sees and secures and basically places it in a tent on Mount Moriah until the temple that Solomon would build is complete. So it's kind of interesting when I talk about this ark. 70 years of this ark would have been 20 years of Samuel's reign as Israel's judge, 40 years of Saul, and the first seven years of David's reign in Hebron. So we think of the ark, we tend to think just David, but there were other hands involved and other people. So it, it really is kind of radical to see that this ark, not only until we lose track of it, it was sometimes venerated, sometimes rejected, sometimes worshipped. Some people understood what it was, others did not. We can clearly see this. When David arrives in Jerusalem, his priority was to provide a proper place to house this ark. So, of course, as I said, the pattern for the, ta for the tabernacle for Solomon's, sorry, Solomon's temple is designed. Um, and we know that the Ark of the Covenant would have been placed in what would be the Holy of Holies, even of the temple. Now, here's an interesting thought for you. We know that from 2 Chronicles 35.3, it makes it clear that the Ark was still in existence at the time of the spiritual revival led by the boy, boy king Josiah. So it's, it hasn't disappeared yet. But when Josiah died, some 22 years later, Judah fell into the hands of the Babylonians, 586 BC. Along with Judah, the Ark of the Covenant, so revered, so misunderstood, so whatever, disappeared, vanished, gone. Now let me stop right here, because see, up until this time, you could say, you know all this, and you've considered all this, and you've read all this, but Here's where it gets interesting. Many scholars believe that it was destroyed at that time. Others believe that it was hid somehow. It survived the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But we do know that the Ark of the Covenant was already gone, missing by the time of Christ. When Christ stood in the temple, there was no longer an Ark of the Covenant within the walls of the temple. That actually is solid. There's no debate about that. Some scholars say that when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, they used two passages to say this. They say that the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord were taken to Babylon because of two verses, one from 2 Kings 24, 13 and 2 Chronicles 36, 18. The only problem I have with that, if the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence and has even a greater meaning with the law inside, with the manna inside, with Aaron's rod inside. And these all represent something. They represent Christ as king, priest, and prophet. If you take those three apart, you trace them back, they basically represent the three dimensions of Christ's servitude of his actions, of whatever he did. So I would say if someone is speculating that it was taken to Babylon and the ark itself is supposed to be representative of God's presence, I highly doubt with, and I'm putting highly doubt in like bold, the boldest you can put, that it was actually taken to Babylon and actually survived the trip there. See, I think that if it was captured in any way, shape or form, I believe God made sure that it was destroyed or lost forever. And if you keep going, you know, there are those that insist that it still exists today. Um, but if you read Ezra 1, 5 through 11, when the Cyrus decree was given for them to return, the ark is not mentioned as being brought back. Just put a period right there. There are those that will, in Jewish tradition, say that the ark was hidden underground in a vault or something like that. 
okay, uh, if that's so, then produce it. No, if, if that's so, then it must be there somewhere. But here's the thing. In, in 1967, during the Six-Day War, hopes were rampant because for the first time, there was the thought process that the Jews would have access to go under the dome and explore and hopefully that great hope to find in the Jewish tradition to find the ark there. It was Moshe Dayan who decided, and I'm, I'm sorry, you might may think wrong of me to say this, but that was the worst decision ever to return it. It was the Muslim authorities that basically were fists in the air to return it and basically to, to close the possibility, literally, until Christ returns, for that area to ever be excavated. So thank you, Moshe Dayan. Uh, but other things that happened along the way in history. There was a news story that broke in the mid-80s. This was a group somewhere from the Midwest, Midwest America that were on a trip to the Holy Land, and some guy came out and he said, found the Ark of the Covenant. And just as quick as that announcement was made, it quickly disappeared along with the group that made it into obscurity. It was just a rumor. The Ark was not found. Um, there was another episode that happened with rabbis who were at the, what, what is Warren's Wall, which was rediscovered, and the belief there, when they rediscovered it, they started digging because the wall basically would typically be right in front or in back of what would have been the Holy of Holies. So they started digging, and the Muslim authorities came out and said, stop, forbidden, and shut it down. So they never even got to see what was beneath there. And who knows if we'll ever get to see what's beneath there. Um, there, are, there are other people who believe that the Ark of the Covenant is sitting in the belly of the Vatican with hundreds if not thousands of um, treasures from around the world that basically were confiscated or stolen, specifically those that were acquired through the uh, Nazi invasion in certain parts of the world. So there's a lot of speculation. Do I believe that? No, I don't actually. I do believe that there's a lot of stuff hidden in the Vatican, but not that. Uh, otherwise, I think if, if that Ark was in the Vatican, You want to finish my sentence for me? <laughs> Don't think so. Uh, one of the oldest traditions regarding the Ark is found in 2 Maccabees, written during the intertestamental period. That's 400 years between old and new. And the thought process there is that the prophet Jeremiah fled with the Ark and buried it in modern-day Jordan. There's also an apocryphal part to this, which is if you go with those folks who believe that um, Jeremiah and um, Zedekiah took um, the daughters of Zed Zedekiah, rather, to Ireland, there are those that believe that the Ark went to Ireland. And I, I, again, there will say, no, I do not believe that either. That's maybe one of the worst uh, theories propounded, although many people and objects ended up in other places in the world, we know that. This theory is not good for one simple reason, and I want you to think about this. Um, it'd be very hard to make a getaway with a gold box on a boat without you being killed. Like, just think about it, marauding bands of people seeing you with some gold treasure. They don't even know what it is, but they're gonna kill you for it. It's kind of like being in LA, you know, in this time, you know, <laughs> if you're wearing jewelry or something, they'll kill you for it, right? It's just kind of like that. Nothing has changed, right? Uh, <laughs> All right, so still we have all these different ideas. Some propose, and I, I don't believe this either, some propose that the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Rome, and why? Because there is a, what's called a frieze or a bas relief. Uh, it is the Titus bas relief that shows a band of what look like Jewish worshipers carrying menorahs and other things basically in a festive procession. Some believe that, based on that freeze, that possibly it was bought, brought to uh, Rome. I 
do not believe that at all. Um, there is also probably the most popular theory that the uh, Ark of the Covenant is sitting in Axum, Ethiopia, in St. Mary's Church. And I don't know if any of you watch, there are a lot of programs that have been produced. Uh, they have guarded this uh, church in Axum. There's one man who basically is the guard regarding the Ark. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think if the Ark of the Covenant if that housed God's presence and God's power and has all of this incredible um, story to it, do you really believe that one man could guard an ark of that historical relevance and value? And let's just say that that church is not, it's locked, it's secured, but it's not Fort Knox. So really? Uh, no, I'm going to say no. And by the way, that story is based on the fact that the Queen of Sheba, who had... Um, visits to Solomon, uh, maybe had a longer visit with Solomon and produced a child named Menelik that the story there brought the Ark to Ethiopia and so on. However, it's not plausible. It's truly not. And I'll tell you why in a minute. I'll get to the why. I think right now I'm sounding like an infomercial that keeps telling you, I'll tell you why in a second, but you never get there, right? Uh, I'm starting to feel like that too. There is a text in Revelation 11 and verse 19 that says, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. This is a future time, of course, as we know. But the question here, and it says, And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. So scholars have debated, is this the actuality of what was the shadow here on earth, or is this something else? Now remember in the book of Hebrews, is repeated what God says to Moses in the Pentateuch. See to it that you build it exactly according to the pattern which I've shown you. And why was that so important? Why? Because think of a mirror image. What was on earth was already existing in heaven. It had to be a mirror image. And why? Because these all typify something. They had to be exact in their nature, fit exact, be exact, dimensions exact, everything. So we have enough theories, but why should we even care? Well, we should. Because when we read the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel gives us a glimpse into a future time. We have that description of the four-square city. We have the description of the temple, the temple, the future temple that will be built. And what is missing in the future temple? The Ark of the Covenant, amongst other things. The Ark of the Covenant is not there. And there's a reason why. The Ark of the Covenant represents Christ. And if we look this temple that will be built in the future, there, there will not be a need to reproduce the Christ event. The book of Zechariah says they will look on him whom they pierced and they will mourn. So there's not going to be a need to reinvent the wheel simply for those, the scales to drop off the eyes to recognize this is Christ the Messiah, the one you said who wasn't, is. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, I want you to think about this, contained Aaron's rod that budded overnight, which represents the resurrection, the resurrected life, the law, which Christ said he came to fulfill completely. And if we think about it, if Christ was in the beginning as the Trinity in creation, everything that was spoken was, came from the triune God. Therefore, the law that was in him, placed in the ark, was fulfilled in him perfectly. It had to be in the ark, because no one else could perfectly fulfill it. And of course, the manna, which represents in, in type both Christ and Christ's provisions for the life of faith. So if we can clearly see this, Ezekiel's temple, the Holy of Holies, is essentially 
empty or void of the ark. Okay, Jesus has already entered into the holiest. We know that. The book of Hebrews says, basically, I even wrote a song about it, how he took his blood to heaven to cleanse an angel band. So we know he was crucified. The veil was rent from top to bottom. The veil separated us from God, had to be ripped asunder, torn asunder for us to be able to have access to God. So the partition is taken away. And in the future, this future temple, there will be no need for an offerer because Jesus has served as both offerer and offering. He served as both. So we don't need to keep going. Now, people have asked this question then, why will there be sacrifices in the temple? Why will this happen? And this is the thing that if you, if you see it for what it is, just as we, in the course of our lifetime, God will school us by events that happen, by good, bad, and ugly, by all the things that come in and out of our lives, the people who will be basically sacrificing in the future temple, they will have to learn the lessons that we have spent our life down here in this time learning. God will basically extract obedience from this. This is why, again, back to the book of Zechariah, when it says they'll be forced to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. We're talking about the Jewish people or those people who refused Christ. That, that is basically a future prophecy. So it's important for us to see how God basically put all this together and then doesn't leave open ends. If we're really looking, I want you to think about how beautiful this is. So we know the picture of the Ark of the Covenant where the blood would be sprinkled, basically that Day of Atonement scene I just gave you, and how this represented the cleansing of the people, the two cherubims facing each other. So you step into the New Testament, into John's Gospel, and Mary, who is peering in, and she sees the two angels sitting on each, each side where Jesus laid. And what you see in the tomb with the two angels in the place where he laid, where essentially, if you want to look at it this way, the great day of atonement for all the world, for all the universe, happened in that grave, from the cross to that grave to the resurrection. This is why we don't need an Ark of the Covenant, because the picture of what Mary saw basically represents what we have received in the new dispensation. It's essentially the Ark, but alive. It is the Ark representing the grave that she saw, essentially, at the empty tomb. And we tend to kind of discount that and say, well, that's a wonderful depiction. But what it's saying, Jesus was, is, and was that ark. He represents the dimensions perfectly, the resurrected life, grace, and if you want to put it, times two, in each case, adequate witness, designed by God that ark was but to teach us a greater lesson about Christ, that as the people needed what was in the ark, God's presence to be with them, we have God's presence in us. This is why the New Testament says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have become the walking version, if you will, of the ark in that Christ. I spent weeks talking about this, Christ with us, our union, our identity with Christ. So it is important to understand that if people are looking for the ark, and I probably could have bored you with a lot more theories and a lot more information, but if people are still wrapped up with the ark, my question would be, why would the ark of the covenant, why should God bring back the ark of the covenant? You know, God knows our frame better than we do. My guess is if, if the ark was found, if it, if it has not been destroyed and was found today, what would people do? They'd probably bow down in front of it and begin to worship it. And that, in that moment, becomes idol worship, not worshiping God. See, God knows what we are capable of in perverting things. So if somebody says to me, well, so that's your final theory as to why 
we will never um, see the ark again. No, that's just one of them. And I believe a, a clear understanding. It seems to me, you know, when we talk about the mystery of something, you know, we get wrapped up. I brought up uh, ancient aliens because they always leave you. There's, there's never anything solved on that program, by the way, right? <laughs> it's just like the government. Nothing's ever solved. But uh, and they could do ancient aliens, too, I guess, in government. Uh, but here's the thing, though. At the end of that program, there's, they're always left with a question. Or could it be? Or is it possible, right? I'm not leaving you with a question today because the reality is God's already answered the question for us. The ark is Christ. We don't need a replica of Christ. What we need is Christ's return. We don't need uh, something in addition to what people are already corruptly doing in venerating things. It's, do you think God has not seen what the last 2,000 years of church history has been with people venerating a finger of somebody or a lock of hair because it belonged to that person? And you don't think that God's going, that's idol worship. That's the very thing that I basically schooled the children of Israel over and we're doing it all over again. This is why the Ark of the Covenant will not be found this is why when people talk about, with great concepts, archaeological discoveries and want to bank everything on the fact that if we could just dig up and excavate, we'll find. Well, that may be true, but in this case, let me just say it like this. How is it, before the time of the ark, or perhaps in that time frame, you know, you've all heard of the boy king, the Egyptian boy king, King Tut. How is it his tomb is sealed up, opened up, and treasures abound are found in there, tre perfectly preserved treasures of wood that's overlaid with gold. But it wasn't, it was treasure that man sought after, but it wasn't treasure of God. It was treasure of the gods. Therefore, who cares about it? People pilfered. They tried to steal and take what they could. Now, you really think if God didn't destroy or deliberately hide the ark away, that somebody wouldn't do the exact same thing and we're back at the same place again? Could you imagine the headlines? Christie's Auction House offering Ark of the Covenant. Tell me, what, what would be done with it if, if, if it, let's fantasize for a minute if it could actually be found. What would be done with it? What do you think people would actually try to do? Well, the first thing when people find artifacts, let's carbon date or let's go to some dating technique, which by the way, for 50 years, we used a certain type of technique to date things only to find out that our techniques were faulty and a lot of the things that we've attached dates to, you've, you've accepted, but the scientific world says, we messed up, but we're not gonna tell anybody. You have a lot of that. So all I'm telling you is the beauty of this depiction. If I at least convey one thing to you, it's the need to read the whole book together, but lift this at a greater level. You know, when we start to ask, why can't we have tangible evidence? I've met so many people like this. I think I've told you this story before when I was working in the prisons and jails and I would get this literally every time I went into the facilities. If, if you could produce a tangible, biblical item for me, Pastor Scott, I would believe. And the answer to that is you're absolutely wrong and hell no, because you'd scrutinize this and say, well, how do I know it's really authentic? And let's go back to some form of carbon dating to assess what it is, only to find out that our methods are faulty and, oh, it's a fraud. All I'm going to tell you is that God actually gave the clue for us. Jesus speaking to Thomas when he said it's more blessed to believe without actually seeing, if you will. My point here is this. God laid out a whole drama, an unfolding redemption of humankind. And in it, he basically put the shadows and types. The people could not grasp. They could not see it because Christ had not yet come. But we of this dispensation who can look back and see this all pointed to Christ to show us there was something better coming down the pipeline. You're reading the book of Exodus. 
when God gives the instructions, build a tabernacle, and this is what you're going to put in it, and this is how you're going to do it, and this is all the prescribed ways, versus look at us now. We stand in the new dispensation, and all we're asked to do is exercise faith, nothing more, nothing less. So for some people, that's just too simple. That's just too easy. We need some complicated thing. We need, we need something to hold on to to make sure we can tangibly figure out this is real. But then if that's so, my friends, why do we need faith? If you can grab hold of something, faith is not required. And this is predominantly, this does require somebody to step into this realm and say, I accept this by faith. But don't just take that, it's in my mind emotionally. Take the time to go through this book, a journey like I just took you on to show you from when God started this process and how he intends to finish it. And you'll see pattern after pattern of God saying basically the same thing over and over and over again. And if I can just kind of get the great uh, extraction out of this, it's that we don't need to go to a box with something in it, why we have become the container. And that is the thing that separates us radically old from new. The people in the old dispensation, they had to look outside themselves. We have received from within. And if you think about it, the Ark of the Covenant, I come back to this to say the Ark of the Covenant, for me, is a beautiful depiction of Christ hid, if you want to put it that way, or Christ who is not visible in me to you, but just like the ark when closed, the presence of God is there. Just like that, except here, God only says one thing. Take me at my word. What I tell you is exactly what it is, like what I say about me. What you see is what you get. God says, this is all I'm asking for you. I'm not asking that you repeat ceremony after ceremony. My Catholic friends do that when they have Mass. We have to keep basically killing Christ each time to make it a sacrifice, and it becomes a sacrament versus looking at it as the one final act. The Ark does not need to be re reproduced. We don't have to have reproduction of Christ's death in communion. He said, and it was spoken by Paul, do this in memory of him until he comes. And when he does, friends, the visual of Christ will be enough for us and for those people who, unfortunately, will be uh, learning the lessons through the millennium of what exactly we have seen in our lifetime. Jesus Christ was that ark in the beginning, and he will be the ultimate ark in the end, as the earth will suffer in turmoil and tribulation. But for those who trust in Christ, safe in the ark, you and I will be, and that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www dot pastormelissascott dot com